Uh, I'm going to be talking about the uh, privilege instruction set. Um, I did not coordinate with Andrew um, before, so um, I don't have the same introductory slide, so I'm going to have to go through this pretty fast. And I haven't had as much coffee as Andrew obviously has, so I won't be talking as fast. Um, so these are the, this is sort of the outline, um, why there's a privileged, start with why there is a privileged architecture. So we need a privileged architecture because um, we need to manage shared resources. There's resources that are shared are things like memory, I.O. devices, and cores. Um, in addition to managing them, we need ways to protect them. So if they're shared, that means there's two different entities that want to talk to them, and we might have to make sure they don't step on each other. For memory, we use vir virtual memory mapping. I.O. is typically memory map, so we can use that same memory mapping with its, with its uh, protection. And we have access permissions generally integrated into the mapping. And there's also some separate functionality to do that. Um, we also need ways to insulate implementation details. So um, there are, when you're trying to execute an instruction that's in some extension that you haven't implemented, um, you need a way to actually execute that. And you do that by trapping. Um, you can handle external asynchronous events like uh, I.O. events, timer events, software interrupts. Uh, and finally, um, for hypervisor extension, we have two-level translation. So in general, we have um, a, a um, layered privileged architecture, um, starting with uh, an application layer. The application layer um, talks to an a, a user environment through um, some ABI calls. So there's hardware underneath that. If you have an OS, then you talk to the OS through a layer, and then, then the OS has to talk to a hardware environment. And if you have um, a hypervisor, you have an application environment that talks to an OS environment that talks to a hypervisor that finally talks to hardware. And each of those has its own little interface. The interface is actually something called an e-call instruction. Um, and all the ISA levels are designed to, to support virtualization. So we have the concept of profiles. So RISC-V has, uh, is fairly feature risk. It has different, uh, lots of different modes, different, um, and options. A profile is something that collects a particular set of modes and options, something called a profile, and it's a restricted combination. Uh, currently, there are uh, several profiles that are works in progress. They're not all nailed down yet. And right now, there are four abstract classes. There's uh, simple embedded systems, embedded systems with protection. On top of that, there are Unix OS-capable systems. And then on top of that, there are cloud OS systems, which can run multiple OSs. Um, and there's a, a link there to the uh, current platform spec specs in progress. Um, some of the differences between those platform profiles are whether things are trusted or not, what modes are, are implemented, and a few other odds and ends. So simple embedded without protection, we have uh, a machine mode. That's the, that's the most basic uh, set of, of modes that we have. The next is machine and user mode. If you're implementing an OS, you have a supervisor mode that slips in between. If you have a cloud OS, then you virtualize both supervisor and user mode. And you can see that what the trusts are and what they've added primarily are things like physical memory protection if you need protection. Um, for Unix, you have virtual memory protection and read-write execute permissions. And a cloud OS would actually have two levels of that. Um, you start out, the most basic system has pretty low cost. You have 16 bytes each of architectural state, timers, and, and performance counters. Um, if you have embedded with, with protection, you can add the uh, user interrupt capability. If you have a supervisor state, then uh, with an OS, you add uh, different address sizes. And finally, if you have uh, multiple OSs, 
uh, you have your usual Unix support, and then you, you add uh, background CSRs for it swap or re get replaced. So what's all this about privilege? So what we have is two, pr two a user mode and two plus, if you include the virtualization, privilege modes, and they're kind of hierarchical. You start with the user mode, which can be normal or virtualized. And you have a supervisor mode, which is normal and then sometimes virtualized. And finally, machine mode, which is the highest. Um, and I say the highest, but there's actually a higher mode. Uh, it, it debug mode is slightly higher than, than um, machine mode, but it can only be entered if you have a debug port connected and it's enabled. I'm not going to talk about much there. There's a separate debug extension, and you can read those specs. Um, we don't support all combinations of modes. So the most basic thing that you can do is just machine mode all by itself. It can kind of virtualize itself. Um, if you want to separate modes, you can have machine mode and user mode. And then in between, you can slip supervisor mode if you're going to run an OS. And finally, if you're going to run multiple OSs, you slip in a virtualized supervisor in user mode. Each one of those privileged modes adds a few extra ops and, and control and status registers. Now, those control and status registers are only ex are, are mode specific in that I have some a status register, but actually there are multiple copies of the status register. There's a machine mode status register and a supervisor mode status register and a user mode status register. Those registers are only available if you're in a mode that's equal to or higher than uh, your operating uh, mode that you're trying to access. So uh, a user, any mode can access the user status, but only machine mode and supervisor mode can access the um, supervisor status. Only machine mode can access the machine mode status. Um, let's see, what else can I say about this? Yeah. So some, um, sometimes those CSRs are completely separate. Sometimes they're actually shared with some of the uh, fields blocked off from uh, lower privilege modes. It's called restricted view. So what are those privileged ops? Um, so all modes have e-call. All modes have an e-call uh, is generates a trap which is directed to a higher privilege mode. E-break generates a breakpoint exception. It's available to all, all modes. And there's also a return instructions, uh, which returns from a trap from some, some specific mode. So there is a U return, an S return, an M return, but you can only execute M return from M mode. You can, only, you can execute S return from either S mode or M mode, et cetera. Um, U return is only useful if you can trap into U mode, and that's only possible if you implement the N extension, which, which lets you trap into, uh, lets you support traps in, into user mode. So those are all the ones that sort of all modes have, although there's some that are, that are particular variants for different modes. Um, if you're in S mode, oh, what I, what I left out here is the fence. There is a fence op, which is available at all modes. But S mode adds a different fence. Uh, the regular fence lets you synchronize updates to, to memory. S fence lets you synchronize updates to not directly access memory, but implicitly access memory. And that's usually things like the TLB. When you do a, uh, an access, you have address translation, you don't actually go through the entire translation process. You actually cache that result. Well, you can get synchronization problems if you've changed the page table, but the TLB is still sitting there thinking it hasn't changed. And this is the instruction that you'd use to, to manage that synchronization. Um, machine mode, we add one more instruction, which is wait for interrupt. Um, that stalls the current uh, thread until an interrupt needs service. 
you can, you can use it as a hint. That is, um, it doesn't actually have to do anything at all. You could have it uh, unstall for lots of different events, not just an interrupt. Um, and you can even do things like if a particular thread is in a wait for interrupt state and you get an interrupt, um, you can make sure that that heart that's, that's stalled, that's the one that gets the interrupt. So we said we've added instructions at each mode. We've also added CSRs. And each thread has its own set of 4K CSRs. And those CSRs, as I said, are mode specific. And you have, and, and the, the, the 4K space is divided 1K registers per mode. Um, CSRs are accessed by dedicated ops, and Andrew talked about that. They're, I forget, 12. Um, and they can implement things like atomic swaps, uh, bit set clear, add, subtract, min, max. Uh, and unlike memory, these are directly accessed only. So you can't index into them. You can always specify a number in the instruction, and that's the one that gets accessed. Um, as I said, the CSRs are mode sensitive. Um, they can only be accessed by code at the pro appropriate or higher privileged modes. And if you try to access an M mode CSR and you're in supervisor or user mode, you'll trap. Many of the CSRs have uh, optional fields uh, or are mode dependent fields. Accesses to non existent CSRs trap. Um, accesses to read, sorry, writes to read only CSRs will trap. But writes to read only fields in read write registers won't, they're just ignored. Um, and then there are optional CSRs. Um, they, optional CSRs is different than a non existent CSR. It's non-existent if it doesn't exist in the architecture. It's optional if it exists in the architecture, but you didn't implement it. Um, and those will uh, read zeros. If you try to read them, you get all zeros result. And if you write them, uh, if, if they're read-write registers, that is, they're defined architecturally as read-write registers, you just ignore the writes. This is sort of an outline of the, um, the CSR address space, and you can see that you can do a lot of decoding just by looking at a few bits. You'll, you, you'll have all these slides. You don't have to take pictures. <laughs> um, and, and this is, this is in, the, in the spec as well. So you have two bits that just say what mode you're allowed to access, a couple more bits. If they're both 1-1, one, one, then you know it's, it's read-only. Uh, a few more bits uh, determine whether it's standard or non-standard, so all this all this space for standard extensions is already uh, carved out of the architecture. There's one particular um, set that's for the debug extension. So we don't have to belabor this one. Um, this is kind of the entire uh, list of, of CSRs. The categories, some of them, there are more than one, like the performance counters, you can see brackets that says there, there are more than one of those registers. But they go in, into these categories. There's floating point CSRs. Uh, there are information CSRs that tell you what kind of, uh, what kind of core you're running on, uh, who designed it, whether it's, you know, what architecture it's running. There's trap setup and trap handling CSRs. There's protection translation CSRs. There's a set of counter and, and timer CSRs. There's configuration for the counters, uh, counter setup CSRs. And finally, there's a set of debug CSRs. There's not a lot of, no. You can see you, I wrote all the CSRs on one page. There's just not that many of them. Uh, and the smallest, you know, a lot of these are optional. The smallest version, I think, was something like 12 or 16 bits of read-write register that you needed to actually implement. That's a pretty minimal core. What I'm going to be talking about, although I seem to have more time than I thought, um, is primarily the uh, trap setup and handling and the protection translation.
So let's start with address translation. So supervisor mode is the thing that adds uh, virtual memory page mapping. It's pretty standard if anyone knows how uh, page translation works on most systems. Uh, you can map 4K pages, 4K byte pages. Um, it does support multiple user mode processes with separate address spaces. So there's a, an address space ID field in one of the CSRs, and that's sort of an extension to the, to the physical address. We want to look at it that way. It's in the uh, supervisor address and translation protection CSR. Page tables have multiple levels that they walk. So you start with some big virtual address, you carve out some bits, you look that up in a table, and we'll point you to some more tables. You carve out some more address bits, look those up in where that first one pointed, and you can do that you know, sort of recursively. Um, so RB32, which only has a 32-bit address, only needs two levels of that page table walk. Uh, RB64, depending on whether you're implementing a 39-bit physical, sorry, virtual address, or a 48-bit, you can do three or four levels of walk. And um, five or six levels is reserved for the RB128, and that gives you a 57 or a 64-bit address. Now, what's interesting is the page table walk can be stopped at any time. Um, so you can read a page table entry, and it's, it will say, I'm not the end, keep going. Or you can say, oh, I'm the end, stop here. So if you did that at the first level, um, you would have one gigabyte pages. If you let it go one more level, you have uh, two megabyte pages. And if you go to all the way, you'll get the, um, the 4K page translation. And that's pretty useful if you want to um, reduce fragmentation in your TLB. So the hardware page table walk semantics are specified in the privilege mode spec, but the semantics are, are specified, but not the, not the hardware. So you could actually trap to M mode and emulate all this and have it walk the page tables for, for TLB refill. Ah, this is a busy slide. It's got arrows. Um, so the top look is what a page table entry looks like. Um, this actually shows a 32-bit format. So uh, a 64-bit format, you know, you see PPN0, PPN1, there'll be, be a PPN2, 3, 4 for longer, for longer widths. But the bottom bits are, are always the same for all the formats. Um, at the bottom, there's just your typical valid bit that says, you know, this translation is valid, use it. Uh, next thing up, we have the read, write, execute protections, sorry, permissions. Um, and there, 000 says you can't execute it, you can't read it, you can't write it. Well, that's not very useful. What it does is indicate that it's a non leaf entry that says go another level. Um, there's uh, a user permission bit that says user code can access this address, this page. Uh, there's a global bit that says pretty much ignore the ACID. Um, this is common to all address spaces and use that for kernel code typically. Um, next two bits are address and, sorry, access and dirty bits used for managing uh, pages. And they have some pretty specific uh, semantics, uh, and sometimes you'll need to do the, that in software rather than hardware, I think. Yeah, so the updates have to be atomic to make sure that, that things stay synchronized. Um, and that's kind of hard to implement sometimes, so you can trap when, if th those two bits are clear and handle them in software. And the two bits are reserved. Now, all that is controlled by the, the SATP CSR. Um, it's not turtles all the way down, if you understand that idiom. Um, at some point, you have to start with a real address. So this, the page table root physical page number, when you start translations, that's where you look first, in that address. 
and then we have the address space ID bits, uh, and finally we have mode bits. The mode tells you whether you're actually doing any translation at all, and it's possible you're doing bare metal, or whether you're doing a 32-bit address, 39-bit address, 48-bit address, etc. They're pretty simple. But there's more control that you need. Um, the, synch the supervisor mode implements the sfence.vma instruction to synchronize updates to those, to those implicitly uh, accessed memory. And there's sort of two bits of variation. You can um, do all p levels of the page tables or just those corresponding to the address you're trying to fence. And in addition, you can do it to all address spaces or just specific address spaces, that is, not, not global addresses. And this is pretty much a generalization of TLB flush instruction, uh, flush ops that you find on other architectures. And what it does is it guarantees that all prior stores are ordered before all subsequent implicit references, as opposed to explicit references. Um, and in, it only affects the local thread, uh, and that means if in a multiprocessor system, if you need to keep everything synchronized, you actually have to synchronize it by sending interprocessor interrupts to the other threads and telling them, hey, this is what I'm doing, you gotta do it too, let me know when you're finished. Hmm. Protection, we have translation and we need protection. So I just showed you the, the slides, that, the slide that shows the page table entry with the read, write, execute permissions. Um, and they're configurable on every page, they support execute only pages. Um, but the read but not, sorry, the write but not read combination is reserved, it's not very useful. So currently if you have that, you will trap. Um, by default, supervisor mode actually can't ac cannot access user mode pages. There's a bit in the page table that said that user code can access these pages, but nothing that says that supervisor mode can or can't, or machine mode for that matter. Um, so, if by default you can't access user pages, but you need to for some reason, there is uh, a supervisor access to user memory bit in the system status register, not in the user status register. And if you need to, typically that, you know, it defaults to off, but if you need to access user memory, you can go turn it on, access your user memory, turn it off again. Um, even even though you can read, you can't, by default, execute user mode pages, even if you can read them. Um, but you want, even though you can't execute from user mode pages, you still want to be able to read user mode pages, execute only pages, sorry. So there's another status, another bit in the status register that says make executable readable and that lets you override things. So if I have an execute only user page and I get a trap, I have to know, well, what is it that trapped? And this lets the supervisor actually inspect that. I can't, still can't execute it, but it can read it. Set the bit, look at the instruction, clear the bit. Um, and supervisor mode can enable and dis disable the virtual memory and choose page table depth in, the, uh, in that supervisor address translation protection register that it has access to. But wait, there's more. Um, in addition to uh, page level permissions, there's also an optional feature that was just added in, in version 1.10, uh, the physical memory protection unit. And this is entirely separate, but can be used in conjunction with uh, the page table protections. And what this does is it has a set of registers that um, by default give nobody any permissions at all. And then you can grant access to specific, to up to 16 specific regions uh, and you, the standard read, write, execute permissions. Um, generally those regions are two to the n bytes naturally aligned, but 
there's 16 entries and you can use pair of them to be base and bounds. Um, they don't affect machine mode in general, they affect everything else, until they get locked. So you can lock the, these, these protections in and when you do that, even M mode is, is, can only access the things that uh, the registers have been pre-set up to do. And you can't unlock it except by resetting everything, complete reset. Um, now I said that this can be used in conjunction with page level granularity, page level protection. And when it is, what happens is you, you do your translation and check the, protect the permissions there, and then you use the uh, PMP checks. And that's useful for, for supervisor modes that you aren't quite sure of, especially in, when you have uh, malicious actors trying to affect things. Okay, in addition to all that, there's the concept of the physical memory attributes. Now you notice that, that there's a lot of things that are, that are not in page table entries. If you look at Intel page table entries, they'll have a lot more bits that specify other things. This is where those other things are specified. It's separate from the, the uh, actual page tables. Generally, these attributes are probably fixed in a hardware that's gonna be a hardware block. And the sorts of things that the physical memory attribute table lets you do is set the address width that a particular address is allowed to respond to. So if I go to an IO device and I wanna read 64 bytes, probably not legal, it'll trap. Um, there's some alignment restrictions. So there are a lot of cases where you have hardware that can't do unaligned accesses. Try to access it, it'll trap. Um, item potency is something that says, I can do things over and over again and I get the same result. Um, IO devices, that won't work. So you need to know that because some processors have speculation and this is a way to turn off that speculation. Um, there's some ordering constraints. Sometimes you care, sometimes you don't. Depends on the address range. This is what tells you. Um, this will, some address ranges are, are not allowed to be cached. This tells you. Uh, sometimes there's some accesses you wanna have higher priority than other accesses. If you can have multiple cores or hard threads trying to get at it at the same time, this is what tells you. This tells you whether atomic ops will work for some address range. If I go in an I.O. device and ask for an atomic add, the I.O. device will go, I don't know how to do that. This is what tells you. And finally, this is where you can say only machine mode can access it, only supervisor mode can access it, only user mode can access. Um, so what, what this does in general is the, the output of this table are two things. One is, yes, it's allowed, or no, it isn't, if it isn't trap. And it says what kind of transaction to put on your external bus that goes out to the rest of the system. Sometimes it'll be a cache read, sometimes it'll be uncached read, that kind of thing. Now, I said this was in hardware, but it doesn't mean it's fixed in ROM hardware. Some of those bits could be configurable. Often, most of them won't be, but they can be. All right, so then we'll get to trap handling. So, RISC V has the, con the concept of interrupts and the concept of exceptions, two different things. Exceptions are synchronous events. Uh, I execute some instruction, it will cause an ex that result of that instruction could be an exception. It's completely synchronous and has, you can tie it directly to some operate as some instruction you just executed. Interrupts are something completely asynchronous, have nothing to do with the instruction you executed. The typical thing is, of course, an I.O. interrupt. We have two other ones uh, in RISC-V that are defined. Um, we have uh, uh, timer interrupts and software interrupts. They're both handled almost identically. Uh, the first thing is, uh, where you're going to trap, uh, and that's the the T TVEC CSR holds where you jump to. Uh, 
Uh, and you can obviously jump, to, you use that as a vector base. So that's where to trap. The mode to trap into is, uh, is, use, is uses the deleg, delegation CSRs. So you always trap to M mode. The delegation CSRs in M mode delegation CSR will say, well, actually, I, I don't need to handle this. Give it to the supervisor or to the user. And you give it to the supervisor. If the N extension is enabled, the supervisor might say, you know, the user can handle this and delegate the trap to the user, the user mode. But in any of those cases, when, the hand, when you get to the handler, the handler will have uh, a cause CSR that said, well, why did I trap or interrupt? And um, the most significant bit actually says whether it was a trap or was, whether it was an interrupt. And there's a value, T value CSR, that gives you more information. Um, and that would be only be for an exception. So if you had an illegal, uh, illegal address exception, uh, the cause would say illegal address. And the T value register would have uh, what that address was. Or you try to execute an unimplemented op, it might have some bits of the illegal op code. And finally, um, the uh, EPC CSR, the exception PC, s says where you came from, <laughs> where you should go next when you return from the handler. And that could be the same instruction if you're going to re-execute, you know, like you got a page fault. You bring in the page and then just return, it'll start re-executing that particular op and this time we'll get a, a good result. Or it could be you know, you didn't implement divide, you get a trap, you do the divide in, in software. When you return, it looks like the, the divide actually completed. And the X status CSR uh, saves the, the, the mode that you were executing in and the interrupt enable that you had in the, in the trapped context. And when you trap the, you clear interrupt enable, because <laughs> you don't want to keep interrupting while you're in the handler. So as I said, traps are always sent to M mode. They can be delegated to lower privilege levels, um, but never to a less privileged level than you started with. That would be, <laughs> that would be bad. Um, so bits. There's bits in the delegation CSR for each trap, and each trap type has, has a bit or uh, exception that says um, whether or not it should be delegated. So you delegate it from machine mode to supervisor mode if supervisor mode exists. If supervisor mode, well, if supervisor mode doesn't exist and user mode trapping doesn't exist, which is completely legal, then you can't delegate anything. Um, you, otherwise, if supervisor mode exists, you can delegate to supervisor mode. If user interrupt handling is extension, the N extension exists, you can further delegate. Otherwise, you stop there. So interrupt delegation only occurs if, if the interrupt enable bit is set for, for interrupts, so interrupted, not exception delegation. Exceptions are always enabled. Um, and after you trap, uh, you set the corresponding interrupt pending bit. So you, you know, well, interrupts that trap set their corresponding uh, interrupt enable bit, and that's what's used. Only the one that gets delegated to gets set. So you can set them even before you take the interrupt. This is a list of all the exceptions interrupts which exist in the architecture. Uh, we have local and global interrupt, uh, sorry, interrupts. And the exceptions are kind of nicely uh, grouped. Instructions, load store, environment call, and, and uh, page faults. These are all in the spec. Um, this is sort of the concept picture of interrupts and traps. You have uh, interrupts come in, they get handled by this platform level interrupt controller and sent to each of the hearts. Uh, and you have each heart has local interrupts, the software and timer interrupts. 
So local interrupts are directly connected to hearts. They don't affect other hearts. And their cause is, is stored in the X cause register. Uh, and there are only two standard local interrupts, as I said, timer and software. Uh, global effects could potentially affect all hearts. Um, and it's determined by the platform level interrupt controller. And they can target any of the three modes, the uh, machine, supervisor, or user mode. Pretty much they're handled identically. That is, you get three things that just have a label on it that says it's one or the other. And it, the only reason that makes a difference is, is if they both come in at the same time, uh, the higher privilege levels will get handled first. So you could get one of three, and if it's, if it's a U mode interrupt, it might be that machine mode will, will delegate it to a user. Um, the way you do a software interrupt is effectively by writing an MMIO location that causes the uh, interrupt pending bit to be set in another core. Um, and only machine mode is allowed to do that, and, it, and you, so you'd have to make a, uh, an ABI call using the eCall instruction to do that to another core. You can do it to yourself, however. And I'm running out of a bit of time here. Um, quickly, there's timer interrupts. Uh, there's each, there's a global time register out in the, in the core, and every heart has its own timer compare register, theoretically. So when the time is larger than the, the uh, time compare, you get a, a timer trap. And you set it up, only machine mode can set it up and machine mode deals with the interrupt pending bits as well. External interrupts, that's the one that people always think of when they think of interrupts. Um, and there, <coughs> the concept of a platform interrupt controller that sends interrupts to whatever cores, it might send the same interrupt to multiple cores at the same time, in which case the cores have to basically fight it out to see who handles it. And the way they do that is they all try to read the, the register from the interrupt controller, and the, the guy that gets the OK is the one that handles it, and the other ones say, oh, OK, I'll go back to doing whatever I was doing. OK, and <laughs> this talk was shorter than I thought. I'm not going to get to all the performance counters, but the slides will be available, and you can see them there or online later. <laughs>